I love Game of Thrones. I think the show is an incredible piece of world building. It has a host of diverse and compelling characters, an excellent production value, and it provides an overdue destruction of the tropes and cliches we've become far too used to in film and TV. And I'm currently enjoying the books too. I've heard many people say that if you like Lord of the Rings, you'll love Game of Thrones, and I think I disagree with that. As a friend of mine put it, it's a completely different moral landscape, and I think that's what made it so popular to begin with. But when it came to producing a video on the Game of Thrones music, I held off for a long while. This is because there's nothing supremely complex or unique going on compared to, say, Star Wars. However, when it comes to musically building a fantasy world, Ramin Jawadi does everything right. So this video will explore how Jawadi musically builds this fantasy world and the techniques he uses to make the drama more compelling. The first of these techniques is the use of leitmotifs. These are themes or sets of notes which attach themselves to a character, place, object or concept. The idea is, as these things develop, so too do their leitmotifs. There is a good history of using leitmotifs in epics. Howard Shaw uses dozens of them in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and I've made some videos cataloguing this usage. John Williams also used dozens in Star Wars, and I've made videos cataloguing that too. The most famous leitmotif in Game of Thrones is surely the Stark theme. I think leitmotifs work especially well in epic stories, more so than in normal stories, because with epics we are given a larger number of characters, places, things to which we can attach our leitmotifs, and we are given much more space, breadth and time to develop our leitmotifs. So instead of just another movie score, it becomes this rich tapestry woven with dozens of leitmotifs which will recur and develop over time. This leitmotif technique harks back to Richard Wagner, the 19th century opera composing giant who is possibly the most important influence on modern music. Wagner's great epic, The Ring Cycle, is a series of four operas lasting around 16 hours in total. These operas feature dwarfs, giants, men, gods, demigods, dragons, a cursed ring, a shattered sword which is rebuilt, incestuous love between twin brother and sister. It's all sounding a bit familiar, isn't it? The Ring Cycle was a huge influence on the epics that follow it, even if Tolkien resents being associated with Wagner. But Wagner's four operas are also extremely rich with leitmotifs, and so these leitmotifs help to build a story and also create a sense of unity over the long span of an epic artwork. It's the same with Game of Thrones. The leitmotifs help to unite episodes across seasons. Take this idea, which we first hear in Season 1, Episode 1. <laughs> We hear it again in season four, episode 10. I will tell you to burn the dead before nightfall. All of them. And again in season six, episode five. And in season seven, episode four. Together against their common enemy. Despite their differences, despite their suspicions, the enemy is real. It's always been real. This motif does not appear often, but it gives us a sense of continuity throughout the series, that right from the first episode, there is this strange, haunting mystery from beyond the wall. Or there's this dragon light motif. We 
hear the tiniest hint of it when the baby dragons first appear at a very high pitch. And then when the toddler dragons first show their power, we hear a bit more of the theme. sad version in this scene. He came from the sky. The black one. The winged shadow. He came from the sky and... And then finally, at this amazing moment, five full seasons in, we finally see a fully grown dragon, and we get this music. Light motifs can also tell us a story or give us clues. Take the Lannister theme, for example. This theme is actually a song called The Reigns of Castamere, about the Lannisters slaughtering their enemies. But it can also be used to tell stories and give us clues. Take this scene from the Red Wedding. As the Frey girl walks down the aisle, we have the slightest hint of the first intervals from the Lannister theme. And then later on, the musicians start playing that song at the celebrations, and Lady Stark immediately knows something is gravely wrong, even if no one else realizes. Take this moment as Tyrion is escaping the Red Keep. He has a thought, and we get the first few notes of the Lannister theme in the harp. Then later, he sees the crossbow and has another idea, and we get another hint of the theme. Then, when he first shoots Tywin, we get a more fleshed out version, but still subtly in the harp. And finally, we get the full theme. Let's look at one more example the music for Jack and Hagar. Throughout season two, Jacken's music is this rising melodic minor scale, which seems to be on a harp. Hagar says nothing. Please don't go, Jacken. And when we meet him again in Bravos three seasons later, it's similar music, but with these percussion instruments and this cymbalom too. We heard these instruments before when Aya was learning from her dance master. It is swift and sudden. 
Perhaps this music is trying to tell us something. But we also hear this kind of music when the red woman talks to Aya. It's a premonition of who Aya will become. And in that darkness, eyes staring back at me. Brown eyes, blue eyes, green eyes. Eyes you'll shut forever. Then later, when Aya discovers the Hall of Faces, we get this variant of the theme. with descending scales counterbalancing the rising ones. And then in season six, when Aya says, A girl is Aya Stark of Winterfell. Jacken's theme is fulfilled with some triumph. Only, even once she's left Bravos, Jacken's music remains with Arya. It's travelled with her back to Westeros. No one. So that's only some of his many leitmotifs. But let's carry on. How else does Ramin Jawadi musically build this world? One thing that ties into the use of leitmotifs is the building of musical places or ethnicities. Jawadi makes sure to give different musical colours to the different ethnicities and locations across his world. And this certainly has forerunners in musical world building. Again, look at Star Wars or The Ring Cycle. For the Dothraki, we tend to get this ethnic percussion. May I present my honoured guests, the series. For the Wildlings, we get this march in 5-4 time, that is, an irregular five beats in a bar, which I think is supposed to represent the Fens in particular. But more than that, for the Wildlings, we get the use of a didgeridoo, an instrument associated with the Australian Aborigines, though here, Jawadi uses it to enhance the brassy bass. For Bravos, we've already heard the cymbal om and light percussion. And there's also certain colours used for marine, and particularly for Daenerys. It's an Armenian duduk flute, I think with a bit of processing, and it's used throughout Daenerys' adventure, painting her with a different colour from the other characters, perhaps a nod to her Valyrian ethnicity. So one thing that is hugely important in the Game of Thrones universe is the balance between reality and fantasy. Certainly in the earlier seasons, reality takes the foreground, and there are only the slightest hints of magic sprinkled around, small whispers of something disturbing or fantastical beneath the surface. Whereas Series 7 felt quite different, a bit more on the fantasy spectrum. So first, let's talk about reality. We know that Game of Thrones is largely based off the War of the Roses, one of the bloodiest, darkest periods of civil war in English history. This war took place in the 1400s, and Game of Thrones clearly aims for a corresponding medieval setting. This is fleshed out in part by the diegetic music, that is, the music that is actually heard by the characters. Whenever there is music played for celebrations, weddings or events, we hear mock medieval music, which pretty clearly places events at a certain point in history. <laughs> Thank you. 
But even beyond the diegetic music, the instrumentation Jawadi chooses for his score generally conforms to this historic time setting. The use of war drums, strings, ethnic winds, cymbalom, which could relate to earlier similar instruments. In fact, if there is one voice that dominates the entire Game of Thrones soundtrack from beginning to end, it's the use of the solo cello. It seems like almost every moment of personal human emotion is underpinned by solo cello, from season one... In the sight of gods and men, I betrayed the faith of my king. Right the way through to season seven. And everywhere in between. It helps that this is the main instrument used for the Stark theme, too. For me, this makes sense as the instrumentation to choose for a quasi-medieval epic. Percussion and war percussion were surely amongst the first instruments to be created. The cello was invented around the mid-1500s, though there were precursors such as the viol, which came earlier. The duduk is well over a thousand years old, possibly several thousand years old, which in this case could reflect the ancient heritage of Valyria, and the cymbalum had several very similar struck instruments before it, dating back thousands of years. All these instruments, strings, percussion, ethnic winds, the cymbalum, these all fit very well into our time period of a medieval epic. Even if they're not all strictly medieval, we can suspend our disbelief somewhat because it just fits well with the time period. And that's why when this happened in season six, episode 10, It felt so weird to me, so out of place. The piano, as we know it today, is a relatively modern instrument. It didn't really sound like this until the later 1800s. It certainly doesn't keep with the medieval soundscape of the other instruments. The piano to me is distinctly from a different era altogether. And Jawadi said he did this intentionally, trying to say that with Cersei comes a new era, and therefore a new instrument. But I remember when I first watched this scene, I felt like somebody else had scored this, or had tried to score over the top of this scene. It just felt out of place to me. I'm obviously in the overwhelming minority. This music clearly impacted a lot of people, and I'm sure many of you disagree with me and found it very appropriate for the scene. But to me, at the time, it just felt odd, like a complete break in character. But clearly, I'm not the general public. And I'll admit it has grown on me since then. I suppose I was also disappointed that we were never able to see fulfilled what I thought was the most interesting plot thread at that point. What was the brilliant Marjorie cooking up? Could she ever outsmart the High Sparrow? We'll never know. They got rid of the more peripheral characters so they could focus on the main plot lines more easily. Which is a shame, though I could see why they did it. And perhaps George R. R. Martin could take a leaf out of that book for his writing. Despite my personally feeling weird about the piano usage, it does lead to an interesting effect. If you can imagine how in a normal episode this scene would have been scored differently, following the drama along closely, underscoring each scene in turn, building slowly to the climax point. This scene is different, Instead of closely underscoring each scene in turn, he's used one long, continuous piece of music, and it creates a montage effect. All these different scenes are connecting by the music into one long thread, and we realize that all these scenes are one long sequence, one person's machinations, leading to the final payoff. 
At times it feels to me like a very strange, static mood, as if time just sort of hangs in motionlessness. Everything is weirdly still, and yet all these machinations are falling into place. It completely changes how the pacing feels, compared to a normal Game of Thrones episode. I'm not sure if that all makes sense, but all that motionless montage very much makes these 15 minutes feel different from anything else in the entire Game of Thrones series. And then, later, we hear these cello arpeggios again. It's like the spokes of the wheel just keep turning. And then the Lannister theme integrates with those arpeggios. It's pretty cool. So anyway, ignoring the singular usage of the piano, we've talked about how these instruments give a sense of reality to the score and place it in a distinctive time period. But as I said, reality in Game of Thrones is counterbalanced by elements of fantasy. In the first few seasons, it was just hints of magic or the unnatural dotted in here and there. Not so much that it becomes a pure fantasy show, but just occasionally to remind us that this world is not like our own, that there are strange occurrences that happen on the periphery. And for this, Jawadi uses subtle organic synths and pads, marking a move from the natural into the supernatural. So in this way, he's using different sound colors for the magic and the fantastical than he would for the human and real elements of the show. Finally, probably my favorite musical trick used by Jawadi and the Game of Thrones team, music and silence, or tension and silence. You might remember the eerie silence of the credits after the Red Wedding. Some of the most memorable scenes in the series have used this trick of music and silence. Typically, music works through tension and climax. A scene or a score will build a lot of tension, leading to a musical climax. And I've talked about this countless times on my channel, both with classical music and film music. But Game of Thrones is different. One of the central elements of Game of Thrones is this playoff between fantasy and grim reality. And this is an interesting point. Music definitely enhances scenes and can make a huge impact. But when they want to show the grimmest, most raw reality, music abandons the scene and we are left with silence. Take this scene where Brienne and the Hound fight. <laughs> It's awesome and it's exciting and the music plays into that fantasy of these two great warriors fighting. But when it gets brutal, we're left with silence. This is no longer a fantasy fight, but naked reality. Leading to this poignant payoff in silence. Do it. Or take this, we get aleatoric screeching for the White Walkers. Which has actually been an idea since the very beginning, as old Nan tells her stories. In that darkness, the White Walkers came for the first time. They swept through cities and kingdoms, riding their dead horses, hunting with their packs of pale spiders, big as hounds. But anyway, we've seen the walkers, and now John has to encounter a walker, for which we get these cool textures and this synthy bass for their fight. Then John is struck brutally, and the next portion is muffled and almost silent as the fight has become raw and a matter of life or death. (gasps) 
and that silence leads to a payoff with its fantastic sound design. Later in the same episode, there's this epic riser as the dead are resurrected. A riser being that musical rising effect we're familiar with that normally leads to some kind of musical drop. the payoff leaves us with silence as the realization sinks in. And here's perhaps the best example. This simple texture, a percussion beat and bare threads are all that's needed to make the Rickon scene intense. Then a musical riser leads you to think it'll be the third arrow that gets him. Then silence. And that's the grim payoff. And one more. There's this great emotional music as John is about to die for his mistakes. Which leads to this payoff. Again, silence. Compare this with The Battle at the Wall, which was pretty much fully scored from start to finish. That's one of my favourite episodes, but unlike that one, they don't want this battle to seem like fantasy. This battle is brutal and real. It made me realise that music can enhance a scene, but silence in the right places can make it feel more real, more tense, more visceral and impactful. And it works best when the acting or action on screen is outstanding and doesn't need music to lift it. Do it. And this raises an interesting point about film music in general. Film music can certainly enhance and lift a scene, sometimes more powerfully than any other camera trick or piece of direction could. But silence in the right places can hit us right at the core, make it feel raw, naked and real. And the thing is, we don't want our drama to always feel raw and naked. We often want our scenes to be lifted, enhanced. It's why the battle at the wall works so well and is so exciting. The music lifts it and makes it thrilling. It's the same reason we love, say, Lord of the Rings. The music lifts it to a higher level of being, which is what we want in that kind of fantasy. And it's also what we want in other genres. We want to escape our own world, to be taken in and immersed in the world that that film or show is trying to create. But when we strip a scene of any music, when we remove the frame that adorns it, the scene is no longer elevated, but has the potential to be raw, real and naked. Game of Thrones has taken an interesting turn in the last season. The show has transformed as it left the books behind. I would say that the series was once defined by an almost constant feeling of dread, that something terrible was just around the corner. This feeling of dread has been replaced now with a more palatable sense of heroism. Its totally grounded realism once made the show popular. If a hero was in a sticky spot, they weren't going to James Bond their way out of it. The consequences were real, and there was likely no way to avoid them. And characters dying really meant something significant, that this was the end of their journey. It almost felt like it could truly be a part of our world, a history based on our own. The use of magic and the supernatural was barely used at all, at least for the first season, and so when it was used, we'd almost forgot that it existed, and then, as if it were some divine providence, we get that kind of payoff. But now the remaining characters seem to be near invincible, and what once would have left them dead in an upsetting but dramatically powerful scene has become more of a fantasy trope that we're used to in other movies. Meanwhile, all peripheral characters seem to be killed off rather too quickly for my liking, without letting their arcs come to some kind of satisfying conclusion. But perhaps these are unreasonable and small things to pick out of a series which has built such an incredible and immersive world, and every member of the Game of Thrones team must be commended. 
In any case, Game of Thrones in the last season or so was approaching more fantasy than reality. And perhaps that was its destiny. As the dragons became fully grown and the dead marched south, of course the story will become more and more fantastical. But the music remains strong, and it will be curious to see the implications of this balance between fantasy and reality, between the human and the supernatural, as we enter the final season. I am very excited to see how this all ends. Hey guys, so I just wanted to let you know that I have started a Patreon page. You'll be able to see behind the scenes footage, early released content. You can vote in polls for what film or piece of music I'm going to cover next. And I'll of course credit my contributors or give them shout outs. So please check that out and thank you for your continued support. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video.